This video is sponsored by Flowkey. We all know about the more obvious ways that a musician can make an income from music. For example, they could perform live, they could play at a wedding, for example, or in a bar. Or they could teach, they could teach one-to-one -one or in a classroom. And um, as someone who has worked as a professional musician for over seven years, I've done all of these things. But there are also so many other less obvious ways that you can make money as a musician. And the key to being a full-time working musician is to have what you might call a portfolio career, where you have income sources from a whole range of places, all making up one career. So today I'd like to tell you about some of the less obvious ways that you can make money using your music. The first income source I'd like to tell you about is production music or library music. So this is music that's used in adverts, on TV shows, on films, but it's not commissioned. It's not like a music supervisor comes to a musician and asks for it. Instead, the musician records music, writes and records music. It gets published by a music publisher and put on a online database. And then if there is a music supervisor who's looking for a song to be in the background of an advert, for example, they can go to this online database, search through the songs, find what they like, put it in their advert, and then when the advert gets broadcast, the composer will get a royalty. And um, the advantage to the system from the point of view of the uh, music supervisor is that they don't have to seek permission, they don't have to get licenses, because it's all pre-approved. And when you're um, working in TV and advertisement, um, you have a lot of deadlines to meet. So it's very advantageous to just be able to go online and grab a piece of music and, and put it in your advert. So that's how it works, and um, as a library music composer, what you have to do is sort of guess what a TV producer might want and what an advert might need. So um, there's obvious, there's like some more obvious styles you can go for, the sort of uh, laid back, friendly style of music. I've certainly done some of that. You can go for a particular genre, so you could go for something that was perhaps more scary, more of a horror thing. I've even done some Christmas themed music before as well. But what I found is that the best way to succeed in library music is to play to your strengths. So my strength is piano playing. So I've actually done two entire albums of solo piano pieces and these have been some of my most popular um, recordings and they've been used in a whole ar array of things. And uh, basically you, you've put these things out there, they get published and then you don't actually get notified straight away when they get used. What happens is eventually you'll get a royalty statement from your um, Performing Rights Society. So in, in Britain, that's the PRS. And um, the li on, on the, the statement, it will have this list of uses that the um, piece of music that you wrote has been used for. And I, I've had things, uh, I think one of my first ever uses was one of my songs was used on an advert on Welsh radio um, telling people about the updated bin collection schedule. That's the sort of uses we're talking about, you know, that needs music. It needs a, mu a bit of music in the background as a bed, whilst the voiceover tells you about when your bin's going to get collected. And I've had a whole array of stuff. I had uh, one of my piano songs was used in the background on the Australian X Factor. Um, I, I can't remember the other uses, but the funny thing is you can't really see these uses. So I know that my piece was used at some point in the background on X Factor Australia, but I don't really stand a chance of being able to find that clip. So it's just this really weird system where you throw this music out into the world and then um, it gets used by these people all around the world and then eventually, hopefully, money comes back to you. But it can be a really good um, passive income source because of course you don't actually um, get paid when you record the piece of music and a lot of the pieces of music you record will never get used and therefore will never make money. But everyone I know, including myself, who has made income from 
library music has found that you basically just accept that you're going to record 20 tracks and maybe only one is going to make money. But if you're lucky, it will make a decent amount of money. The next income source I'd like to tell you about is being a session musician or session producer for hire. So a lot of us, I think, imagine session musicians as being people who get brought into a recording studio, sat down with a band, and they um, contribute to a record, and then they get paid for their work. And that does still happen today, but because of the nature of home recording, because of the nature of the internet, a lot of session work today is done remotely, on your own, at home, and you're hired by people over the internet, perhaps the people who you will never ever meet. And this can go from the most basic level where you're just contributing to a singer-songwriter's passion project, or you could be contributing to something quite big, like a film score or a, a big album that's going to get released. And I've done an array of um, sessions like this. Um, the first session I ever got like this was actually creating the music for a children's exercise class. Um, basically, it was this local um, business person was starting this exercise class where uh, parents and children would go along and it would have all original music. And um, it was largely sort of um, adapted versions of, of nursery rhymes. Old MacDonald had a farm, E-I-E-I-O. Other things I've done, I've been approached by um, singer-songwriters who want their song recorded. And um, I once actually got this uh, priest from London who had written some um, some songs to, that he wanted to be performed in his church. And uh, these, the ones in particular that he wanted recorded were Christmas themed. So we, uh, I never met this guy in person. I just talked with him over the phone. He sent me audio recordings and I um, basically, you know, worked out the chords, worked out the melody, hired a singer, made an instrumental backing track. We recorded it, sent it back to him. There was a bit of back and forth, you know, with little changes, um, but he was happy. And it's, it's this really funny thing where you suddenly get this weird gig out of nowhere and you find yourself recording a Christmas song um, for someone that you'll never meet. Flowkey is a great way to improve your skills at the piano. Flowkey is an interactive app that guides you through learning songs and developing your skills. They offer a regularly updated selection of over 1,000 songs, including classical pieces, jazz standards, recent pop hits, and classic rock tracks from bands such as The Beatles, Queen, and Pink Floyd. If your New Year's resolution is to learn piano, then Flowkey is a great resource to get you started. To get started today, follow the link in the description. So my third income source on this list is um, a bit of a wild card. It's playing in care homes. So I think when people think about how a musician can perform and how they can make money from it, they think of playing at functions like weddings and parties. They think about playing in pubs and clubs and bars. They think about hotels, restaurants. And these are all great, and I've done plenty of those. But a other great place to play music is care homes. And that's for a, a multitude of reasons. Um, reason one, if you play music in a care home, you're probably going to be playing there during the day midweek, which is a time that you're never really going to get another gig. So if you're looking to fill in gaps in your diary, it can be a great way to, to grab some, up for some extra gigs. Um, another reason though why it's a brilliant experience is it's a very unique audience. Um, they, they are an audience who are looking for things to entertain them, you know, that they are, they haven't got much stimulating them during their day. So you're not just some background musician, you're an event. And it can be, um, you know, a really interesting experience to, to play to these people. Um, of course, you get a whole array of people in care homes and retirement homes. It depends on what type of home it is. I, you know, I played to a um, dementia ward once and um, I think one of the best heckles I ever got was I was playing this song and <laughs> someone shouted out, I, I prefer silence than this. Um, which I brushed off, and I think that's the sort of thing you have to be ready to do in care homes, is sometimes um, it's uh, an, an unusual crowd. But for every negative experience you get, you will also get a really amazing positive experience, because music has a real magic quality to people, particularly people who are suffering from dementia. Um, and you know, it's well, it's well accounted that um, music can often bring them back a bit. It can un unlock memories for them. 
particularly if you play music from when they were young. So I always tried to play you know, American songbook classics because um, you'd get these people who were generally non-responsive, but then you play this classic song that they know and suddenly they're, they're singing along. So it can be a really amazing experience. And um, you know, care homes have a budget for entertainment. Um, it's not like you're, they're not like charities. You're not sort of ripping them off, if you know what I mean. They, they want people to come in and perform. They have the budget. And it's a really, really insightful experience. So I'd recommend it to anyone who wants to be a performing musician. So the fourth and final income source I want to tell you about is what I'm doing right now. It's YouTube. So there is a, such an array of ways that you can make money on YouTube as a musician. Um, there's an array of types of content you can do. And there's also an array of ways you can monetize that. So let's talk um, to start with about what content you could do. So uh, you could do educational content, like what I'm doing. And that can range from um, straightforward tutorials on how to play a particular song, or it could be more in depth, um, sort of music theory concepts, like what I do here. Um, you can also perform cover songs on YouTube. You know, lots of people have made a career performing co cover songs on YouTube. One thing to bear in mind with cover songs on YouTube is you will be technically caught for copyright when you, um, perform a cover on YouTube, but YouTube has this scheme where if you're performing a cover, they will still allow you to partially monetize your video. So let's talk a bit about monetization. So the primary way of monetizing videos on YouTube is ad revenue, putting adverts on your video. And as I was just saying, um, YouTube will allow you to put ads on your video and you get a cut of that money that's generated when people watch the video. If you're using copyrighted material, you know, that could be your um, covering a song, um, you might not be able to monetize your video or you might be able to only partially monetize it. And sometimes when you're using copyrighted material like I do, you should be able to monetize your video because it should count as fair use, but they will try and demonetize you. Um, now I could spend hours talking about the battles I've had with copyright, but um, rest assured there is ways to get around copyright issues. So don't let that stop you from your plans of starting a YouTube channel. You can do it. And sometimes it's better to dive in, make some videos, get some views, and then think about how to circumnavigate copyright issues. Um, but ad revenue isn't even the only way to make money on YouTube. Another popular method that I'm sure you've all heard of is Patreon, which is a far purer and more direct way where people can just pledge money to support what you're doing. Um, another way is um, sponsorships, although generally they're only available for people with a larger audience. Um, merchandise, which isn't something I've done personally, but can suit um, different channels. And I think that, but I think the most important thing to remember with YouTube is one of the things it can do, particularly on a smaller scale, is it can stimulate other parts of your career. So for example, I know this band, a, a jazz jive band, who um, they released a version of Bring Me Sunshine on YouTube and it went viral. We got about, well, it got way over a million views. And they probably did earn some money from the ads on that video, but that's not what it did for their career. What it did for them is it put them in front of a mass audience of millions of people. And that meant that they got so many new inquiries and opportunities um, off the back of that video, which um, then led to far more live work and touring and all sorts of things. So it really stimulated the other more traditional parts of their career and acted as a marketing tool, a, a really valuable bit of promotion. So I think that's the best way to look at YouTube is that don't get hung up with how to make ad money and, and get sponsorships. Just do something which will attract an audience, foster that audience. And then once you've got people who are interested in what you're doing, then think about how you can um, transform that into something that makes you a bit of money and keeps it going. Because at the end of the day, we all get into music to make music, but of course, sometimes you need to make some money so you can make some music. But anyway, I hope that was a helpful uh, insight into some of the less common ways that you can make money as a musician. As someone who has done this for seven or so years now, I can assure you that it is possible to be a working musician. It is possible to be a full-time musician and make quite a good income, but you just have to be willing to think outside the box, to graft, and um, to not be afraid to 
getting involved in a whole array of different styles of work because you never know what's going to work and what's not going to work. And um, you know, eventually you probably will find that you'll naturally proceed down one path, but you can't find that path until you try out all the options. And thank you as always to all of the patrons who make my videos possible, including the names you see on screen right now, and Andre Sainz Diarja, Andy Deacon, Andrew, Andrew Sussman, Austin Barrett, Austin Russell, Bob McKinstry, Boomer Dale, Brittany Parker, Cameron Villa, Colin Aiken, Charles Finn, Chris Cabell, Christopher Ryan, David Bennett's Hart, David Rivers, Donald Howard, Dr. Darren Wicks, Eleanor Skorchenko, Eugene Leroy, F.D. Hodor, Greg Kubowski, Gilda Molotona, Hamish Brocklebank, Hernan Kutcher, Hugo Miller, Ivan Pang, Jake Fisher, J.A. Kokensberger, John Dye, Josh Domchen, Josh Sandlin, Justin Vigam, Mark Saitera, Mark Siekenhagen, Max O'Keefe, Melody Composer Squared, Melody Shonard, Michael Vivian, Nathan Lawrence, Nathaniel Park, Nick Cheng, Paul Middleton, Paul Miller, Paul Paisel, Peter Dunphy, Richard Pride, Roger Clay, Sean Kennedy, Steve Daly, Stephen Lazaro, Tim Beaker, Trisha Adams, Tim Payne, Victor Levy, Vidad Flowers, Vladimir Khodakov, Volti, The Washington Shakespearean Festival, Wayland Fairbanks, and Zaphod.